Biomass the original renewable energy. It's been part of our lives since our ancestors learned to control fire. In fact, it's made possible by the sun whose energy is absorbed by trees and plants through photosynthesis and then released when organic matter is burned or decomposes. First, there's plant waste. Wood scraps, sawdust, and crop waste can be collected from farms or manufacturers. The waste is burned to heat water. The hot water creates steam. The pressure of the steam spins a turbine. The turbine powers generator. The generator creates electricity. Simple, really. Next up, animal waste. Also known as the problem of cow poop. The solution, wastes from farm animals can be collected in a large tank called a digester, filled with bacteria that eats the waste and converts it to methane gas. The methane is captured and burned to heat water and create steam. Sound familiar? Second verse, same as the first. This same principle can also be used to capture methane, a potent greenhouse gas with 25 times the heat-trapping ability of carbon dioxide from landfills. Once a section of the landfill is closed off, pipes are run from the waste to collect the gas, which can then be burned to make electricity or heat. Biomass may not be the prettiest form of renewable energy, and it needs to be used carefully and thoughtfully to protect ecosystems and prevent greenhouse gas emissions, but it can be a smart way to make use of waste.
Water covers 71% of the Earth's surface and is vital to our daily lives. It can also be a clean, renewable, reliable source of electricity. Hydroelectric energy comes from capturing the force of moving water that's in our Earth's rivers and oceans. We do this by using the movement of the water to spin hydraulic turbines. That generates kinetic energy which is converted to electricity through a generator and then sent to the power grid. Most hydropower is generated from dams built on rivers and streams, often where there's a big drop in elevation, so gravity can help us out. Dams block the water's natural flow and force it through a large pipe with the turbine and generator, before releasing it back into the stream on the other side of the dam. Today we know that dams, most of which were built before the 1960s here in the U.S., can disrupt river ecosystems. There haven't been many new hydro plants built in the U.S. in a few decades, but some existing dams are beginning to be tapped for their electricity-generating potential, and existing hydro facilities are being upgraded to be less harmful to plants, fish, and wildlife. This helps us get the electricity we need by protecting the natural environment around us.
let's talk for a moment about the job of the catalytic converter. In a nutshell, their job is to convert harmful pollutants into less harmful pollutants, emissions, before they ever leave the car's exhaust system. They are still most commonly used in motor vehicle exhaust systems. But you'll also find them on generator sets, forklifts, mining equipment, trucks, buses, trains, and other engine-equipped machines. A catalytic converter provides an environment for a chemical reaction where toxic combustion byproducts are converted to less toxic substances. Catcons are now fitted to both petrol and diesel engines, and I must say they do a good job, as long as they are clean and not clogged up with carbon and other deposits from the engine. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon, the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track, but the spread backward around the track, like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real-life jams move backward at about the same speed. Land reclamation has been carried out along the coast of Tokyo Bay since the Meiji period. Areas along the shore with a depth of fewer than 5 meters are simplest to carry out landfills, and sand from the floor of Tokyo Bay is used for these projects. The topography of the shoreline of Tokyo Bay differs greatly from that of the pre-modern period due to ongoing land reclamation projects. Tokyo Bay includes about 249 square kilometers of reclaimed land area in 2021. Aggregate household waste production is enormous in Greater Tokyo, there is little room for traditional garbage disposal sites, waste is rigorously sorted at the household, much of it is turned into ash and further recycled into Bay Landfill. The Knowledge Challenge invites proposers to submit proposals for research activities aimed at improving our basic understanding of entrepreneurs and the levers, tools and methods that can advance entrepreneurship in the United States. The Knowledge Challenge is open to proposers conducting research in universities and academic institutions, laboratories, companies, nonprofit organizations and as individuals. Collaborations between academic researchers and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship support programs and other entrepreneurial ecosystem builders are welcome. The Knowledge Challenge may grant up to $400,000 annually for project teams, up to $150,000 annually for individual researchers, including hiring contract or research assistants, and up to $30,000 annually for students or student teams or doctoral researchers. Most societies throughout history employed some strategies to help people in poverty meet basic needs. Before the 20th century, religious groups and private charities often led such initiatives. 
Today, these are called welfare programs, and they usually take the form of government-provided subsidies for housing, food, energy, and health care. Typically, these programs are means-tested, meaning that only people who fall below a certain income level are eligible for benefits. This policy is designed to ensure aid goes to those who need it most. But it also means people lose access as soon as they earn more than the qualification threshold, regardless of whether or not they're financially stable enough to stay there. This vicious cycle is harmful to both those in poverty and those outside of it. Mainstream economic models assume people are rational actors who weigh the cost and benefits of their options and choose the most advantageous path forward. If those in poverty know they'll gain no net benefit from working, they're incentivized to remain in government assistance. The internet can be a scary place these days, especially because of cyberbullying. It's difficult to open a newspaper these days and not see a story about this. It's a really nasty and growing problem. Cyberbullies are real cowards. They hide behind their computer and scare people, send them hate mail or threaten them. Even worse is when they publish pictures of their victims online. I have a friend who had a really bad time at the hands of a cyberbully. He or she spread lots of gossip and lies on the internet. My friend's reputation was badly damaged. A really bad thing is how young cyberbullying starts. Many schoolchildren physically bully others in class and then continue online. Their victim isn't safe anywhere. I sometimes start off by telling audiences that I'm going to tell you what you know already. And if I ask you which country has the highest levels, which of the rich, developed countries have the highest level of violence, the biggest prison populations, the highest levels of obesity, you'd know it was the United States. If I ask you which ones do well on all those things, you'd know it was the Scandinavian countries. I think the only thing that surprises people is how closely these sorts of outcomes relate to income inequality, not only at the extremes, the United States and the Scandinavian countries, but also in between. In fact, in our work, you can remove those countries at the extreme, and you've still got a significant Leaders need to show more composure than ever before in the workplace. With the change management requirements, increased marketplace demand and intensifying competitive factors that surround us, leaders must have greater poise, agility and patience to minimize the impact of uncertainty. How leaders respond to these and other growing pressures is an indicator of their leadership preparedness, maturity and acumen. The composure of a leader is reflected in their attitude, body language and overall presence. In today's evolving business environment, it is clear that leadership is not only about elevating the performance, aptitude and development of people, but more so about the ability to make people feel safe and secure. Employees have grown tired of working in survival mode and thus want to be part of a workplace culture where they can get back to doing their best work without the fear of losing their jobs.
marine garbage is the most visible and easily recognized of all ocean pollution and causes serious damage to marine wildlife. Every year millions of marine animals die worldwide because of this type of pollution. The small personal pieces of garbage, casually discarded, are often the most damaging. While some of this trash is left directly on the beach, much of it originates as street litter from coastal and inland cities where it is washed down to the sea through storm water drains and rivers. Some trash, particularly plastics, can last in the ocean for years. There are many different items which make up marine garbage, ranging from large commercial fishing nets which can intage and maim or kill animals, to small plastic bags that can be mistaken for food and ingested by marine life. Newspapers are supported primarily by the sale of advertising space. Interim grades slash results will be posted on the board outside the student lounge. The undergraduates need some specific sources to analyze a specific program. All of the library's databases and electronic sources can be accessed through any computer connected to the university network.